Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going verse by verse to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're closing, we're closing in on the end, guys. We, uh, next week is the end of this series. Here's Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Let's finish strong. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. And then even as he's still speaking, Judas suddenly arrived. So Jesus repeats the prayer. And the prayer is for the will of God the Father to be done. He is praying exactly as he instructed us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. There's prophetic significance to this as well. When he describes the cup of the Lord, we've seen this biblically in Psalm 75. And in Isaiah 51, there's Isaiah again, I'm telling you, man, like we're going to be, we're going to like read a good portion of Isaiah by the time we're done with the Matthew series. And we're going to return to a lot of Matthew while we're in our Isaiah series, which comes up after a brief series on, on evangelism training. Here's Psalm 75, seven verses seven and eight. For God is the judge. He brings down one and exalts another. For there is a cup in the Lord's hand full of wine, blended with spices, and he pours from it. All the wicked of the earth will drink, draining it to the dregs. And then here's Isaiah 51, verse 17. Wake yourself. Wake yourself up. Stand up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk the cup of his fury from the Lord's hand, you who have drunk the goblet to the dregs, the cup that causes people to stagger. This imagery of the cup of God, the cup that's in the Lord's hand, this is what Jesus is describing. When he says in verse 39, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Every time the Mormon missionaries come to my house, I talk with them at length. They've stopped coming though. Um, and it's because I taught them, uh, I taught them 2 Peter 3. And I told them, friends, this is you right now and you're in danger and you need to repent. So I think that they probably marked me on their database. But they referred to this passage and they said, look, Jesus and the Father had different wills. And they, they, they tried to use Matthew 26. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's go to it. Um, at that point, my kids were all kind of gathered in, in the living room. Um, I know it's weird, but we really love these old school Disney movies like um, um, Asa, what's it called with uh, the, the, the toad? Um, the Adventures of Mr. Toad? And Ichabod. <laughs> That's what we were watching and they came in. Uh, these missionaries showed up. I didn't want them to come in and, and I, I, I just, usually I'll take them to the back deck and offer them water uh, instead of coffee. But I didn't want my kids to overhear what they were saying. And so I, I ran in real quick and I grabbed my Bible. And I was like, let's actually read the text. Because in this text, Jesus three times prays for the will of the Father to be done. That's a, it's the precise opposite of the argument they're trying to make. Trying to say that Jesus would go against the will of the Father when three times he prays for the Father's will to be done. I get what they're asking though. Everything that is human about Jesus is dreading the weight of the cross that is to come. It's because the weight of the cross is precisely that of the sin in the world. He bears upon himself the sin 
of everyone who has believed in him. And according to 1 John, even the, 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 the atoning power of Christ's work on the cross is sufficient to have atoned for the sins of the whole world. It does not. We do not preach universalism at the Redemption Church, but 1 John does describe the limitless capacity of the atoning work on the cross. So he knows that the weight is immense, that the mantle is heavy, that the cup is deep and to be dreaded. So he does not want to go to the cross. He came with full knowledge of what was to come. That he emptied himself, as Philippians describes, does not, as I've, I've heard of false teaching on this, the idea that Jesus lacked foreknowledge when he walked on the earth, that is not what it means that he emptied himself. It, mean, it means that he physically walked among us. That he was timeless and now he's temporal. That he existed before everything and, and without him there's not a single thing that exists that wasn't made through him and in him we live and we move and we have our being and yet he lived and moved and was here. So he physically exists with us. We know that he is attuned to the Father. He could even tell Peter, I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail because the devil has gone to God the Father and asked for permission to sift you like wheat. For example, he knew everything. He knew everything about the woman at the well in John 4. He knew about the coming cross. He told them numerous times what was to take place. So with full knowledge of what was to take place, he still dreaded it. With full knowledge that he would resurrect Lazarus, he still wept by the tomb. With full knowledge, actually came greater dread. He dreaded it because he had perfect foreknowledge of what was to come. He was now a timeless being, temporal, fully God and fully man. To be fully man is to be confined to the ticking of the clock and knowing what was to come. The timeless one, now within time itself. And as the hours tick by, they bring the cross closer. And that is the source of agony. It is a, the hypostatic union in the Jesus, the Father, the Spirit are one. And as Jesus walks the earth, he has subjected himself to the ticking of the clock. And it is unbearable. He dreaded the cross so heavily that he sweat blood. The medical term for this is hematidrosis. He wanted this cup to pass from him. I am deeply grieved to the point of death, he said in verse 38. Now, uh, the disciples keep falling asleep on him. It's Peter and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, as Jesus would give them their wrestling names. He said to them, I'm deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. He tells them to stay awake in verse 38, and then they can't stay awake. All right, he, he finds them sleeping in verse 40. Uh, he finds them sleeping in verse 43, uh, and then they just can't seem to stay awake. But Luke 22, 45 gives us a little bit more insight as to why. When he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. That's Luke 22, 45. Peter was talking a big game, you know, just moments ago. From our perspective, you know, it was just a few verses ago. But now, as they've left the upper room where the prescription has been given for what would become communion, I think, upon the resurrection of Jesus, it could have been a, a year later until they observed it again. But in that moment, Peter talked a big game, and he kind of rallied everybody else around him except for Judas. It was like Peter and the remaining ten disciples were all like, we'll die before we forsake you. And now that they're quickly going back on this. They were grieved by what Jesus was saying, according to Luke 22, 45. So it wasn't just that they were, it wasn't just that they were sleepy. They were exhausted from grief. Their spirits were willing, but their bodies were weak, Jesus said. See, the time is near. The Son of Man, here it is again. He refers to himself 28 times as the Son of Man um, in the text. This is coming up on one of the final times that we hear him say that. He'll say it again uh, in verse 64 of this chapter. But we're running out of those. The, the count is almost to 28 at this point. See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. He knows what's happening. He has perfect foreknowledge over all of it. He is tormented in everything that is human about Jesus in dread for the immense weight, the immense agony that he knows is to come. He is to become a sin offering, like a scapegoat. He bears the full weight and only he could bear it. 
No one else could drink this cup, only Jesus. This also contains practical instruction. What did Jesus do in his time of greatest grief? He prayed. The Son of God prayed to the Father in his times of greatest grief. We, likewise, when we are in our times of greatest trial and greatest testing and greatest dread, there's practical application to this text. Pray. Stay awake at night and pray if you can. Pray, pray, pray. Pray if you sweat blood. Pray if you're going through something immense. If there's something in your cup that you dread, but you must drink it because this is what God has given to you, you pray your way through it and you're grateful that you, what's in your cup is not what was in Jesus' cup. You could not drink the full wrath of God, but God may have put something in your cup that you dread. I've had to face things that I've dreaded. I've, I've in my cup has been immense suffering in my lifetime. I've buried a child. I've been through pain. I've been through humiliation. God has put things in my cup that I dreaded but there's nothing compared to the cup that Jesus drank. I don't, I don't try to speculate as to what's in other people's cups. Don't covet the cups of others because you don't know their contents. You don't know what's going on in the household of your high school friend who just seems to have been breezing through life all these days. And just, uh, you know, you see photos on Facebook of their yacht and everything. You're like, man, I wish I had that cup. You don't know what's in that cup. You don't know what has been in that cup. You don't know what is to come in that cup in the future. All you know is that God has given your cup with your cancer, with your trials, with your death of a child, with your car accident, with your pain, your depression, your anxiety, your addiction issues. This is your cup. You drink deep the cup that God has given to you because it is nothing compared to the cup that Jesus drank. And all of this, his prayer was, your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. May that be your prayer as well. Drink deep the cup God has given you without coveting the cups of others and with gratitude that Jesus drank the cup that we could not possibly. In your time of greatest and most dire need and dread, pray, pray, pray.